Hello there everybody, it's Brendan Thomas Marriott here. You're very, very welcome to the next installment of our series on the end times. We are fairly trekking through the chapters now. All right, so here in chapter 12 of Revelation, John the Revelator is shown a vision. In that vision, he sees a pregnant woman and affiliated with her, are the sun, the moon, and the stars. If we look all the way back in Genesis, and like I said, if your knowledge of Genesis is lousy, you're not going to do a very good job interpreting Revelation. <laughs> but in Genesis 37, verse 9, um, which is the first chapter that really begins looking at Joseph, the dreamer's life. Well, there are two Joseph in the book of dreamers. The, uh, Technicolor dream coach, Joseph. The sun, the moon, the stars represents the nation of Israel. Again, the body of Christ get raptured up before the end times begin. And then Israel, the bride of Christ, become the main focus in the end times during the apocalypse. I also believe that's why she is a woman, the bride of Christ, Israel. So in Revelation 12, um, there's a sign, even on the 23rd of September, 2017, a lot of people got very, very excited for the Jewish Feast of Trumpets, um, where they looked at the stars and they recognized the moon, Jupiter, Virgo, and the sun made the shape of a woman, and Mercury, Mars, and Venus, Leo, the shape of a lion, so a lot of people kind of drew connections between what they saw in the sky and Revelation 12, verse 1. So uh, God does hide certain secrets and mysteries in the stars. Now that we should seek them out from there, we should always inquire of the Lord personally. But he always speaks and he has revelation hidden everywhere, especially in physical things. So in verse chapter 3, there's an allusion to the Ten Kings and the Antichrist's rule. It's called the Second Babylon, or the Reformed Roman Empire, where the feet mixed with baked clay and iron, it's all the same thing. And in verse 3, 4, they are ruled by the dragon. The dragon is a multiple-headed monstrosity with many heads, and many horns, and his desire, his aim, is to totally and utterly annihilate the woman. We'll go through the explanation of exactly what uh, all those dragon heads entails in just a little while. So in verses five to six, the dragon and his dark angels decide to attack heaven. This is the largest assault the forces of darkness will ever wage against heaven itself. However, the darkness is of course defeated by the Archangel Michael and the devil falls to the earth. Not one to uh, be outdone. <laughs> His tail goes flick and one third of the stars in the sky falls to the earth. Once he gets defeated, absolutely every one of his minions, principalities, authorities, um, demons of wickedness, spiritual wickedness in the high places, um, minion spirits, Jezebel spirits, Absalom spirits, spirits of trauma, perversion, point you name them, every last one of them is going to fall to the earth. Satan's not going to fall down alone. Oh, no, 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 no. And he really and truly sets his sights on Israel once and for all. He had an answer Christ, the man of lawlessness on the earth, who had signed a peace treaty with the counterfeit intentions with Israel. But the devil absolutely despised that country so, so much. So then we have a little exploration of the past and the future. The dragon tries to kill her baby, the man-child. This is like Satan operating in King Herod to try to kill Jesus, 
as a baby when he stirred up um, Herod's wrath against all the baby boys two years old and under in Bethlehem. But the male child, Jesus, with the iron scepter, because he is coming to conquer evil and to rule the world with iron fist, gets lifted up into heaven. That's Jesus ascending to heaven. But when he comes back, he will mean business. Yellow. All right, then. Seven and eight. Really and truly press into the reality of that great and terrible war in the heavenlies. Never before have there been a war quite like this. It'll be a cosmic war of absolute immense scale. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. And again, heaven refers to, you know, the atmosphere, the sky, an actual capital H heaven. So at this point, he has no more room in heaven, no more access to that throne room where he judges us all day long. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. I can just read on and on and on because that's just the most phenomenal event in the, in the Bible. The Bible's full of phenomenal events. This is one of the great ones. Daniel 8.10 also talks about Satan and the heavenly host going at it in an all-out war for heaven itself. Listen to this. I was about to read it nine ten, so bear with me. It grew, that's the Antichrist's horn, until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down on the earth and trampled on them. So even the Antichrist will be complicit in these shenanigans. The attempt will be to take over two worlds at once. All right then, verse nine. The dragon and his angels lost their place in heaven. So Satan tries to steal heaven, tries to seize the Lord's throne. Of course, he loses. And after this, his angels, well, his angel wings truly get clipped and he loses all access to the heavenlies. He is earthbound. So I've said before, and such as in Revelation 12, 10, that all day long, night and day, there is a throne room in heaven, which he can access. And he enjoys going there and telling the Lord how wrong he was to die for us and what horrible, disgusting cretins God's kids are. And Jesus never once looks at him and says, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they do suck. <laughs> no. Jesus has never regretted saving anybody. All right, Revelation 12, 11. The saints overcame the devil, the dragon, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. But I got a euro for every time I heard somebody say that they have overcome the strategies and weapons of the darkness by the blood of the lamb and their testimony. <laughs> it's lovely sentiment. Pray it over yourself, declare it. But in the context, that last line's very important. These saints overcame the dragon because they would not get the mark of the beast and they would not worship the idol of desolation. They overcame because they were killed and therefore they went straight to heaven. All right, verse 12 to 16. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. Again, because they're dead. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. 
He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And failing to take over heaven, well, pretty much knows that it's game over. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for a time, one year, times, two more years, and half a time, three and a half years, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Here we're talking about the final 1,260 days of the Great Tribulation, three and a half perilous times. Why are we declaring woe to the earth? Because the Antichrist so has suffered a fatal wound at the halfway point. The dragon gets tossed down to the earth, very, very badly wounded. And the only relief demons have is when they are within sight, or is when they are within a mortal coil, especially a human vessel. So he sees the defeat of Antichrist, and Satan just jumps on in. It's Revelation 17, 11. So therefore, because he knows his time is short, because everything else he's planned has absolutely come to ruin, he just goes for M80, mutually assured destruction. How many can he kill, steal, and destroy in three and a half years? That the woman is given wings, that's God protecting Israel. Just like he protected Mary and Joseph. The dragon spews water on Israel. Have you heard the phrase, a sea of people, lots and lots of people? That is Sam chapter two. The devil rounding up the nations of the earth, the Gentiles, again, in the body of Christ, the Gentiles carry the revelation of the cross. We have the key to this dispensation, if you will. In the end times, <laughs> the Gentiles are the villains. But the earth swallows the water. Nature will fight on behalf of God. The very same way Absalom tried to kill David's men, but it was the trees of the forest killed more of Absalom's men than even David's men did. The same here. God will use nature to fight on behalf of his people. And then the dragon came after her offspring, so there will be Gentiles who put their faith in the Lord too, through the witness of the 144,000. So the dragon will do everything he can to kill those as well. So the halfway point of the tribulation is a very busy time. <laughs> At half time, Satan is cast from heaven. Revelation 12, 7 to 12. The beast, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, recovers from his mortal wound through Satan's indwelling power, a satanic resurrection. It's Revelation 13, 3 and Revelation 17, 10 to 11. Just then, the beast breaks his peace treaty with Israel. He enters the temple and he declares that he is the one true God. He erects the abomination of desolation. That's Daniel 9, 12, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, Matthew 24, 15. The beast, empowered by Satan, killed the two witnesses, Enoch and Elijah, Revelation 11, 7. The false prophet then imitates the miracles that the two witnesses had performed, and he gives life to the image of the beast, a statue that walks and talks. Revelation 13, 13 to 15. And the Jews, particularly the righteous ones, the ones who have some gumption, know what's going on, run for the mountains for protection. 
terrified, knowing that destruction is just around the corner. It's Revelation 12, 6 to 17, and Matthew 24, 15 to 21. So the halfway point is very, very dramatic. So the Antichrist Mark 1's death occurs three and a half years into the end times. Satan swoops into his body, and the world worships Satan the dragon for having resurrected the man. They resurrect, sorry, they worship the man because he got resurrected. <laughs> and then they worship the image of the man because it becomes like a, a walking, talking machine or stone or brick or wooden shape, whatever it will be. Revelation 13, 3 to 4. Top at one of the heads of the beast that seems to have a fatal wound, but it gets healed. Imagine if Jesus were to resurrect, come out of his tomb on live TV today. Think of just how many would be like, oh my goodness, it was true all along. That's basically the kind of reaction you're going to have in those days. Only I find <laughs> the wicked believe wicked things more easily than the righteous believe righteous truths. Maybe that's a little bit negative or cynical, but that's been my experience. So the whole world is filled with wonder at what they see, and so I follow the beast. And people worship Satan because he gave authority to the Antichrist to rule the world, and they worship the Antichrist saying, who's like this guy? Who could ever challenge him? He is well class. And this is when the Antichrist really becomes the Antichrist Mark II, the second version, bigger and badder, because the devil actually lives within him. And at this point, he becomes so, so haughty that he actually calls himself God Most High, Melchizedek, Jesus. As the anointed cherub, Lucifer was the high priest of Jesus. In calling himself the Most High God, Jesus, he's calling himself the High Priest of God. So he's literally claiming to be Christ at this point. Daniel 9, 27 and Matthew 24, 15 kind of fit nicely here. It says he sets up the Idol of Desolation. Um, there was an Idol of Desolation that Daniel prophesied. That was about uh, Zeus, but we'll look at that in a later video. But what Daniel saw was, it was a real vision, but it was like a foreshadow of an even worse time. And the Antichrist is the full summation uh, of all that wickedness. Daniel eleven thirty six says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. If someone's to be kidnapped or arrested, they'll be kidnapped or arrested. If they're to die, they'll die. So this prophecy really and truly has to do with Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, which again happened between the Old and the New Testament. Um, but again, it was a preview or a trailer of worse things to come, but it finds total and utter completion and fulfillment in the days of the actual capital A Antichrist. And then Daniel 7, 21 says that as I watched, this horn, this king, the Antichrist, waged war against the saints, and defeated them. And look at this in Matthew 24, 15, 28. You see him standing in the holy place, the third temple in Jerusalem, the abomination of desolation, an idol that Satan makes move, corporealizes, brings to quote unquote life. Let those in Judea, a very specific place, run to the mountains and hide there. Don't take your staff, don't take your cloak, don't take your mobile phone. Run for your lives, because if you don't, 
death is certain. How miserable those days will be for pregnant women and women who've just had a baby and are nursing their baby. Pray that your flight does not occur in the winter because if it does, it'll be even more difficult. Or on a Sabbath, because they will be observing Sabbaths and uh, it will be a very, very difficult time to observe Sabbath um, with all of their practices biblical practices and human religious practices while running for your lives. And those days will be cut short for the sake of the elect, those who have been predestined, otherwise not one would survive. There will be a lot of deception, people saying, look, here's the Christ, there he is. But they're false Christs. Don't even trust their power. It'll be great. It'll be wow. It'll be splendid. It'll be out there, it'll be noticeable. Don't believe it, it's full of crap. Or someone says, there he is in the wilderness. Or here he is in the inner rooms. Don't go. It's a trap. They're trying to lure you in or to lure you out to kill you. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus comes back <laughs> for the second coming to do what sin once and for all, you'll know. Everyone will know. It'll be very, very obvious. So Revelation 13, 1 says, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on his head a blasphemous name. The seven heads represent seven evil monarchs in the Bible, seven evil kingdoms. We see Egypt being a very, very big one who came against Israel in Exodus. There's Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Medes, Greece, Rome. The seventh is the Antichrist, Mark I. But he's got a wounded head, he gets fatally injured. But he's not alone. He also has ten other beings with him, ten complicit kings, complicit in evil. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, that's the devil, and I saw the Antichrist coming out of a sea of people. Seven wicked kings who had already fallen, and ten wicked kings yet to emerge, on each had a blasphemous name. The Antichrist I saw resembled a leopard, and the feet like those of a bear and the mouth of a lion, the culmination of the Babylonian, Persian, Medes, Greek and Roman empires. The dragon, the devil, gave the beast his power and his throne on the earth and great authority. The ten horns that you see, or the ten crowns, well, they're ten kings. They know what they're doing is wrong. They're pure evil committed to evil, and the earth gets divided up into ten districts, and they become tyrants or emperors over each district. But Daniel tells us the feats are clay and iron, maybe artificial intelligence, androids mixing humans with a machine, um, maybe creating the new generation of hybrids, but also, there'll be weaknesses, because those two material, they don't really go together. So there'll be fractures. They'll be united in evil, but not united in heart for one another. Knowing that the beast is the Antichrist who holds political power during the second half of the Great Tribulation helps us make sense of the Ten Horns. Daniel says that the ten horns are the ten kings who come from this kingdom, Daniel 7, 24. And Revelation corroborates this. The ten horns you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour, <laughs> it's not a literal hour, just means a short time, seven years, will receive authority as kings along with the beast, and they will war against the Lamb. Revelation 17, 12 to 13. 
So the Antichrist will form a revived Roman Empire, the Roman Empire Part Two, and these are his underlings. And he's their supreme leader. Some people call it the One World Government. To see more about what it looks like, you can check out Daniel 2, 41 to 43, Daniel 7, 24 to 27, Revelation 13, 1 to 10, which we've just read, and Revelation 17 to 18, which we will come back to in a future video pretty soon. And these wicked evil kings, they're ambitious men, but they ultimately cede power to the beast. The beast is not all powerful though. He does suffer a fatal injury, but he gets healed or resurrected by the devil. So he's a seventh king, but he's also an eighth king too. So the Antichrist Mark II is Satan's superior hybrid, a corpse that he himself animates and walks around like in a human meat sack. Revelation 17, 10 to 11, the beast who itself is an eighth king and who is all the seven and was and is not and shall not ascend at the bottom of the pit that goes to destruction. That is a very, very long name, my goodness. So he's the seventh king out of the seven empires, but he's the eighth because in his second version, the devil is running him like a machine. He was alive. He's not alive because he gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's the devil at the end of the tribulation gets locked away in the bottomless pit in the abyss in Tartarus, and then the devil comes out again. So an absolutely mad story, but uh, there's a lot in there. It's heavy stuff. Hopefully I broke it down for you in a way that was understandable. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to send an email or write a message in the comment box below and uh, I'll be happy to get back to you, okay? But uh, other than that, that's all from me for now. And in the next video, we are going to look exclusively at the Unholy Trinity. And we're going to see everything you need to know as it pertains to the end times regarding Satan, the Antichrist, and the False Prophet.